Praise the Lord. Alrighty. So as as come on now. As tempted as I might be to sing tonight, I will just see if I can keep my cool and not sing. So we're just going to go ahead right into it real quick. Matthew chapter 12, verse 48. And before we turn our Bibles, um, I know that a lot of the singers are out there, maybe trying to recover from all that singing. Uh, but the band is still up there. Can we just give these guys a big hand and just celebrate God? And, um, and I'm aware that this, this particular um, Saturday has been a busy one for these guys. You've been in uh, ministry all day. And I just... Uh, want you to know that there's nothing anybody can do to replenish you except what God does. And so just open your heart to be replenished by God. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. Matthew 12, 48. I don't think we've read this verse of scripture in a long time, uh, but there's a reason why. And, um, and it's not even a coincidence because as I was coming up here, Brother Matthew said to me, um, her niece was choking at family dinner tonight. And her face was already turning white, but by divine intervention, she is doing fine. And we just, can we just give God praise? Let's just give God praise. Every, every, every miracle of such is worth celebrating in the season that we're in, particularly in this season that we have been praying so much for children. Isn't that awesome? And then I'm going to share with you later on one of the things the Lord showed to me while the worship was on. Uh, but very quickly, Matthew chapter 12, verse 48. Um, I want you to have an expectation that the Lord will speak to you through this verse of scripture. One of the things that we were introduced to in this scripture is such a, necess is such a requirement or is such an important um, ingredient when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So I want you to keep your, your heart open and just let the Lord speak to you. The Bible says, but he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And this is, was, this was um, an account. If I, let's read from verse 46 real quick so that you can get some context. The Bible says, while Jesus, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he, Jesus, answered and said, in particular to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, may we receive understanding as your word comes forth. Because your word, the entrance of your word, brings light and it brings understanding unto the simple. So we have no doubt in our hearts that the word of life that comes forth today is potent with all of what we need. The prayer we are saying is that Lord help us to receive all that which your word brings today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let us all be seated. Praise God. Let's be seated. Let's be seated. Let's be seated. The Holy Spirit has been impressing upon my heart of late. Emmanuel, would you mind at all if I turn this thing toward me so I can hear me? Or oh, I cannot hear me, but psychologically, because it's facing away from me, I just feel like it ain't right. Alrighty, that, that helps my faith. Thank you. Oh yes, that helps my faith. Someone is like, well, your faith should not be based on what you see. It should be based on what you hear. Don't worry, we'll get to that in a moment. There are certain things that you see that helps your faith. How many people here are aware that your faith needs to keep on increasing? Oh yeah, your faith needs to keep on increasing. Your faith needs to be on the rise. There are certain things that I have seen that I have helped, that have helped my faith a great deal. Praise the Lord. And so um, we're not going to overanalyze it, but it helps my faith. Now, like I was saying, certain things that the Holy Spirit has been impressing upon my heart of late is that we need to constantly be reminded that God has already done everything that you need him to do. 
the Bible says that he has given to you every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So there is never a time in our lives that we are waiting for God. We can wait on God, right? Which I think we need to actually talk about what it means to wait on God. Remember when we were still children, we thought waiting on God meant waiting for God. People will say, oh, we're praying and we're fasting. We're waiting on the Lord. Yeah, you remember when we used to think that was what we But in reality, in our day-to-day -day application or use of that expression, it never means you're waiting for somebody. When you go to a restaurant and a waiter is waiting on you, they're not waiting for you. You understand what I mean? They're not waiting for you. You're already there. You understand what I mean? You're sitting there. You're the most present person at the restaurant. You're there. They can see you. They're not waiting for you. They are waiting on you. And what does it mean to wait on someone? To wait on orders to come from them. When the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. It's not they, those who wait for the Lord. Many people, God has called them, but they are waiting for God. And God is like, no, 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 no. I am waiting for you. I have done everything that I need to do. I have given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now I am waiting for you to receive what I have given. Heaven is full of stuff. We're waiting for you to download what you need. So you see what I mean? We are never, ever waiting for God. Let me say this again because I want to be sure that we're all clear that waiting on God is not the same thing as waiting for God. Waiting on God means to be receptive to the instructions that are found in the Word of God with the eagerness and the enthusiasm with which to go forth to do that which it says. What it means to wait on God is to be like that waiter that is right there. Whatever you want, you want water, they get you water. You want coffee, they get you coffee. You want your salad to come before your dessert, they make it happen. They are waiting to do that which you say. And that is the reason why the Bible says that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. God is going to continue to renew your strength because the strength he gave you yesterday, you have already used it in obeying that which he says. So it gives you more strength. And the Bible says why you keep going back and forth doing the will of God is not going to allow for you to be faint. The Bible says they will run and they will not be weary. You can't be running and be waiting at the same time. Those who wait on God, what does it mean to wait on someone? To do what they say. And you and I both know that this is the United States of America. If your waiter doesn't run fast enough, you give them a bad review. And now people get fired because of bad reviews. So what do waiters do? You say a word and they go. That's why the Bible says they will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Simply because they are doing God's bidding. When you're fasting in your home and you're sitting there too tired to be useful to anybody, that is not waiting on God. That is doing a bodily exercise. The Bible says bodily exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable. It is good for you to pray and fast. Don't get me wrong. You need to do that because you are teaching yourself how to lord over your body. If not, your body will lord over you. We know how it works. If you allow your flesh to continue to be your flesh, it has no mission in this life than to continue to run toward corruption and evil. The Bible says the carnal man is enmity against God and will always be. The Bible says this flesh is never going to be born again. So don't you think for one second that one day your flesh is just going to become so holy that it will not want to hold somebody in unforgiveness. That your flesh is going to be so holy that it would not want to rejoice when something bad happens to somebody. No, things like that. You know when bad things happen to people that are bad in your own eyes, you kind of rejoice. No, the Bible says that that's what we do. The Bible says when the righteous prospers, the city rejoices, but when the wicked tumbles, oh, there's a shout of joy. But what are we supposed to do? Even though that is our natural tendency, the Bible says that we need to pray for our enemies. Not pray for them to die. The Bible says pray for them to live long so that they can see the glory of God on your life. But we know if we don't fast, 
the flesh would want to take over. So you fast. But that is not waiting on God. All right? Waiting on God is actively doing what he says. So now let's go back to the issue at hand. The issue at hand is that many of us are waiting for God to do something. So I want you to take a moment and just think about your situation right now. Your life. Your status quo. And ask yourself, truly, be honest. Am I waiting for God to do something? If we are to be honest, I would tell you that maybe half of us in this room are waiting for God to do something. I'm waiting for God to give me that job so that I can do this for my family and do that for my family. I am waiting for God to allow the interest rates to come down so that I can purchase that property. I am waiting for God and God is like, wait a minute. Do I need a low interest rate to give you a property? Do I need a job to equip you to look after your family? Some people are saying, oh, this sleepless night is going to be over the moment God just gives me $12,000. And the Bible says the Lord gives his beloved sleep. If you're waiting for peace because of money, then there is a price on your peace. And the moment the devil knows that, you're in trouble. Because Satan doesn't want you to be at peace. And so he's always looking for the things that you have hinged your well-being on. And he will always taunt you with those things. You become invincible to the devil. The moment everything that your life depends on is what God says. The moment you're no longer waiting for God to do something, then the devil can no longer taunt you, torment you, or take your joy. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that somebody got it. But let me say this, folks. I am talking about a daily conversation with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I want to take the conversation in another direction and he brings me right back to it. He shows me the faces of people and he tells me this is where this person is at. This is what they're waiting for, that which I have already done. They just need to believe. Jesus said something. He said, only believe. We may not have all the time in the world in this place today to do an inventory or to take an inventory of our lives, but I want to encourage you that I should go home today. Be very sincere with yourself and before the Lord. And write down all of the things that you're saying, oh, I'm waiting for God to do this. Waiting for God to do that. And then begin to tell yourself the truth from God's word that God has already done it. Let me show you a verse of scripture real quick. Praise the Lord. And we're, in fact, let's finish this Matthew 12, 48, then I'll take you to 2 Corinthians. The reason why we've come to Matthew 12, 48 today is this. I keep telling us that there are five foolish virgins that will not go with the bridegroom simply because they did not prepare. And I've been reminding us that we should not allow ourselves out of sympathy or sentiment to lose the opportunity that we have been given by God to see the bridegroom when he comes. For those people that haven't read the Bible before, let me tell you the story real quick. Jesus told a parable about, of 10 virgins who were supposed to be all married to one man. Again, it's a parable, okay? So don't receive revelation and say now the Lord says marry 10 virgins and then you want to add nine more to the one that is in your house, okay? It's a parable. You know, because these days people are so eager to find whatever they can see in the Word of God. You know, and just say, well, Jesus said the man had ten wives, so why should I settle for just one? I can do better. <clears throat> no, you can't. <laughs> so this, and the reason why it's ten, someone asked a question yesterday while we were having the, was that you? You asked the question, wow, that's good. It's not always that people say that they were the ones who asked the question. In fact, some people deny that they didn't ask the question. I'm just kidding. But it's a good thing that you asked the question. And the question was, what is the significance of the number 10 in the Bible? And then the answer that I gave was that the number 10 is symbolic. Um, it is, um, what's the word? The number 10 represents tests. Is symbolic of God testing man. And because God is faithful, when God wanted man to test him, he also applied the same number 
10. Remember in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, where God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. The word tithe means the 10th part, 10%, the number 10. The Lord says, now try me and see, or test me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. So you see the number 10 represent test. When Jesus was talking about the test for readiness, he used 10 virgins. When God was testing the nation of Israel to see if they would be ready to truly possess the land, 12 spies were sent. Two of them represented the two witnesses. The other 10 that were tested, they failed. And how many of them? 10. So every time, almost every time you see the number 10 is usually indicative of tests. So the 10 virgins was also there to show one of the very last tests that we as human beings, and in particular the Ecclesia, will be made subject to before Jesus returns. And that is the test for what? The test of perseverance. Are you able to persevere through the darkness? Because it wasn't like they did not apply their makeup. It wasn't like they didn't get their garments ready. They did all of that. They even got lamps and oils because they know that the bridegroom could come at night. But where they failed was in how prepared they were to persevere in case of a delay. Five of those virgins were called foolish virgins. Why? Because they did not have enough oil in their lamps. For some reason, they concluded that the bridegroom was going to be on their time. God is always on time, just not on your time. I mean, wouldn't you love it if God was on your time all the time? That you would have gotten married at 12 and had your first child at nine and a half? You know, if every time you desire a thing or you ask for it, it happens, the world will be worse than hell. Because we try to put a time on things that we do not even fully understand. You understand what I mean? And that's why God is never late, because how can you prove that God is late? No, he's never late because he's the one who determines the time for a thing. And the Bible says he makes everything beautiful in its time. And so God is never late. Nothing is ever delayed from God's perspective. It is just us. We kind of like make up all these men. We have this mentality of when things need to be and how things need to be. And if it is not your way, then Yahweh is in trouble. You understand what I mean? When it's not your way, you're like, okay, you see, it's God. How can it be God? Has he told you a particular day? Someone says, yeah, but the other day God told me that I was going to be married at 26. But then in reality, did God tell you or did you tell God? Because that was me when I was 18. I said I was going to get married at 24, no later than 26. Right? And after a while, I convinced myself that God told me. Whereas in fact, I was the one who told God. And so when I was 26 and it wasn't happening, in fact, I was so determined that I got engaged even though I saw that there was fire on the mountain. I ignored all of the signs. I told myself, no, I shall not walk by sight. <laughs> That's why I say sometimes the things that you see help your faith because it helps your sense to be correct. I ignored all the signs. There was trouble around the lady, but I was like, no, I'm about to be 27. This thing needs to happen while I am still 26. I arranged to get an engagement ring. They got me the wrong one. I was like, it doesn't even matter. It has to happen. The day that I was supposed to propose, the ring fell. We had to look for it under the car. I was like, it doesn't matter. We still have to go ahead and go all the way. Because I, I was convinced. And let me tell you something. I went ahead. I got the lady engaged. And I was looking at the devil. I'm like, you tried to stop me, didn't you? And the devil was like, I wasn't even aware that you had a deadline. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You're a liar anyway. I don't believe you. I kept on keeping on. And then at 26, almost hitting 27, the engagement broke off. I was speaking in tongues. I was binding. I was losing. And then eventually when I saw that it wasn't going to work because someone sent me a birthday greeting, happy 27th. And I'm like, it's over. And so I went to God and I'm like, God, why did you do me like this? And God was like, so remind me exactly when I told you. And then I couldn't remember. And then he reminded me when I told him that that was what I wanted. And he told me that that was not even his will for me. And you know what happened in that instant? The Lord sent somebody to remind me that there was one day I was in their house. We had just finished Bible study. And I told her that I was going to be married at 30. 
I spoke that prophetically, but then I was holding on to my foolishness on the daily. So at the end of the day, how can that be God? God is faithful. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The Bible lets us know. Remember last Tuesday, we talked about the fact that let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to. We need to stop being so full of ourselves like we know stuff when we don't and allow the will of God to be done. A lot of our frustrations in our walk with God will disappear the moment we say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus was faced with all the trouble in the world, when he was carrying the sins of the whole world, when he had to deal with all the punishment for the sins that you haven't even committed, what prayer did he say? Jesus was not on the cross binding the spirit of lies. He wasn't there binding lust. He wasn't there binding prayerlessness. He wasn't praying for all those things because there is a point that things get to that you know is completely beyond you. And what did he say? He says, Lord, he said, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. If that was you and I on the cross, we will itemize all of the problems that we're dealing with. And we will be questioning God why he's not dealing with this one and dealing with that one. Wherein sometimes God allows for things to be arrayed against you because he wants you to commit your spirit back into the hands of your loving father where it belongs. But in this generation, we are so, we're, we're control freaks. We want to control everything. So going back to the five foolish virgins, they thought they were in charge of when the bridegroom would come. But the five wise virgins, they committed their, themselves completely to God. We don't know when he's going to come. We're just going to prepare to wait so that no matter what happens, whenever he comes, we will be right here. And that gospel of perseverance is that which we need to preach today because many people are giving up on God. We have stopped praying certain prayers because we felt like God didn't answer. We have stopped loving some people because we have concluded that they are irredeemable. If only we would learn to persevere in all things. The Bible says that love is long suffering. When you truly love like God loves, you will persevere in all things. So I want to encourage you folks today, choose to be like the five wise virgins who have the oil of perseverance because you are not in any way, shape or fashion in control of anything. So let us learn to just commit ourselves to God's care and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. These are my desires because you've asked for it. God wants to know what your desires are, but you are not supposed to turn your desires against yourself. You see, because many of us, what we do is we take those desires and we magnify them so much that we now come under the pressure of what we desire. It is only a desire. Put it before God and then see what the will of God is. Look at how it compares to what you presented. The Bible says many are the devices in the heart of a man, but only the counsel of the Lord will stand. But many of us don't even care what the counsel of God is. It is that which you want is your way or the highway. It doesn't help you, it doesn't help me, and it makes it difficult for us to enjoy what God has. Now, I said all of that which I said about the five foolish virgins because when the warning came forth, the Lord says we need to be mindful of the people who have not prepared as they should, people who don't trust God as they should, who have gotten themselves tangled up in all kinds of troubles. They would come to try to sap your own joy. The Bible says, be mindful of those people and do not cast your pearl before swine. Look at what happened here in Jesus' ministry. Jesus was doing the will of his heavenly father. He was healing the sick. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And suddenly, his mother and brothers appeared almost out of nowhere but they refused to come to where he was. They wanted him to come to where they are. And let me tell you something, those are very real situations. 
wherein you are doing the will of God, but situations and circumstances that you are supposed to be naturally responsible for and committed to will try to pull you away from where you are doing the will of God. You need to have the same resilience that Jesus had because anybody else would have out of sympathy and to say, oh, or sentiment, let's use the word sentiment. We'll say, well, you know, my heavenly father will understand because this is my mom for crying out loud. Remember, that was the same Jesus that was teaching the Pharisees that they needed to honor their parents. And now his own mother was outside and his brothers were outside and he did not go to them, if anything at all. He asked the same person who was trying to put pressure on him. There is always that one person that wants to make it their own problem. They will take it very personal. They will come and say, do you not care about your family? Don't you care about this job? Don't you care about this neighborhood? Don't you care about your own life? They would want to be the voice of reason in your ears. But those voices of reason that do not align with the word of God should not get your attention in any way. So Jesus turned to the fellow and said, let me ask you, who really is my mother and my brothers? You see, the problem we have quite often is, because, is this. We don't allow ourselves the privilege of knowing the truth about things, about people and situations. The only way you would know is to test, the Bible says test all spirits, that you may know that which is of God. Jesus was like, okay, you're asking me to leave what I'm doing and go to some woman who claims to be my mother or some dudes who claim to be my brothers. What exactly do you understand brother or mother to mean and the guy was there thinking what do you mean who is your mother she gave birth to you these are your brothers they kind of look like you they just don't do what you do you understand what I mean because there are certain times wherein we're too busy assessing things the way they have always been presented to us when we're supposed to check them against what the Word of God says let me now let's now read on verse 49 and the Bible says he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother I'm about to make some declarations here and once I start you know the reason why I took my time to lay that foundation God is calling for us to pay attention to the things that matter. There is not that much time. So this is kind of like a continuation from Tuesday in case you're not connecting the dot. On Tuesday, what did we talk about? We talked about the fact that God says, I will not forever strive with you. There is a time that has been allotted for you to do that which you must because the rewarder is coming and is going to reward everyone according to his or her work. Jesus is the rewarder. He says, I am coming and my reward is with me. And he's going to reward each and every one of us for the works that we have done. I know that there are a thousand and one preachers just at the end of the street here preaching that works do not mean anything that by grace you have been saved and they just throw the entirety of works out the window and that is the reason why Christians are no longer fruitful today because they have been pushed to this particular doctrine of I am only here saved to receive saved to receive grace every day but why did he give you grace just so that he can save you from hell if the only reason why you're saved is so that you miss going to hell or miss God's punishment, whatever that looks like, then the moment you say, in Jesus' name, I give my life to Christ, you should have just been raptured to heaven. Your mission is complete. But the same Jesus who came to die for you and I, he said, greater works than I did shall you do. He said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your heavenly father. Jesus is coming to reward the works that you do. About three months ago, I gave us an assignment. I said, we need to go and look at the difference between works and works because G the Bible says our works of righteousness are like filthy rags before God. But then the Bible also says, 
who are you to say you have faith when you don't have works? And some people have concluded that maybe God hasn't made up his mind yet. But do you want works or you don't? Which one is it? But there are two kinds of works. You see, it is not what you do that matters as much as why you do it and when you do it. You see, works are not to be done so that you can please God, so that you can find salvation. No, we are saved purely by grace through faith. And it is that same faith that pleases God. But that which we do that we call the works that Jesus is coming to reward refers to that which we apply that grace to after having been saved. Let's put it this way, very simply. I don't do works like coming to church, like giving to the poor, like praying and studying my Bible so that I can be saved. That would be trying to attain salvation by my works. But guess what? After having been saved, I now study the word because I want to know more about his love. I want to develop the vocabulary with which to engage him in conversation. This God who loves me so much. Because now I am saved, God has given me his full attention. The Bible says the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God, but he will hear the cries of the righteous. So I am doing the works now because I have been saved and now it has a meaning and it has value. You understand what I mean? I am not going to preach to my neighbors because if I don't preach to them, I will go to hell. No, I preach to my neighbors because I am so joyful about what Jesus has done for me and done for them. And I want to just tell them, look, he's already saved you. Because that's what the good news is. It's not a good requirement, it's a good news. You understand what I mean? So these are the things that we are supposed to do greater works than Jesus did. And so when Jesus was here doing the works, as an example to us, because he is not receiving the reward, he is the giver of the reward, distractions came that seemed to be legitimate. And Jesus questioned the legitimacy of those requirements because they were seen by him to be contrary to the will of his heavenly father. This is where I am ultimately going with this and I hope that you grasp this revelation. In this world that we live in, particularly in the West, there is so much demand that is placed on us on the daily basis. Let me tell you something. Many of us sitting here, maybe not many sitting here, but some people that will watch me later because I know the people here are all very spiritual people. But there are people out there that will watch this thing on YouTube that have never read the scriptures, even just the 66 books in its entirety once in their Christian walk. There are so many believers, so many Christians, people who have been born again since the spring of 87, who have never read it. Now, if you haven't read the 66, where would you find time like the Berean Christians to go and find other scriptures that are referenced in this one? You understand what I mean? Many people here love the King James Bible. Do you know that the original King James Bible that was published had 88 books in it? But the Catholic Church in the Benevolence gave us only 66 because they, they were planning for us to become lazy. And we haven't even read the 66. Now when are you going to read the others? Do you know what I'm saying? But we have all the excuse in the world. The man, I don't have the time. I'm so busy. Huh? I am here trying to do the will of God. But out there, someone is making the demand on me. Jesus was there doing the will of his father. Can you have a more legitimate reason to stop doing what you're doing than when your mother who gave birth to you, that teenage girl who went through all that trouble to birth Jesus, she was out there calling for Jesus. Anybody else would have said, you know what guys, this is my mom. And those are my brothers. I am their older brother. If I don't show them the way to do it, they're just going to continue to give Mary problems. Those reasons are the reasons that we consider legitimate. But I want to tell you, do not regard anything as legitimate as long as you have yet to test it. Test it first of all and say, is this what God wants me to be doing at this time? Is the will of God for me to take that phone call when I know that person wants to gossip and her record is 40 minutes minimum? We know certain people that they will come, but something within you will say, oh, but you're a human being. You need to know what's going on. No, I don't. 
I don't need to know what's happening when I know what will happen. You understand what I mean? Because let me tell you something. Many of the reasons why we do what we do are the reasons that have been told to us to be legitimate, to be honorable. This is what you do. As a man, this is what you do. As a woman, this is what you do. But then, in the times that we're in, knowing that the time is short, if you keep answering every call and fixing every problem, when are you going to do the works that Jesus is coming to reward? Jesus is not coming to reward the person who has the most friends. Jesus is not coming to reward the person who has the perfect lawn. Jesus is coming to reward the ones who do the works of love, who do the will of the Father. We cannot continue like this. The reason why we are powerless against little situations is because we are not seeking with all of our hearts that which the Father is saying. From God's perspective, anybody that does not pay attention to his word is regarded as a wicked person. Can I prove that to you? Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay, let me help you here. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. Is in the, is the fifth book in most of our Bibles. 32 verse 20. Are we there yet? Deuteronomy 32 verse 20. Okay, put a marker in your Bible at Deuteronomy 32 because I want to show you the way Jesus applied this scripture. Okay, if you're ready there, let's just quickly read it. We might come back to it. Deuteronomy 32 verse 20. What does it say? It says, is it verse 20? Yes. Let's read verse 19 first. It says, when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocations of his sons and his daughters and said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faith. God says, they're trying to provoke me. These sons and daughters. They're trying to provoke me. He said, but let's see what's going to become of them. Because they are a wicked and a perverse generation. Why did he call them a wicked and a perverse generation? Let me show you where Jesus was quoting the scripture in Matthew chapter 16. Come to Matthew chapter 16. I put my marker here because we're coming back to this Deuteronomy for sure. Matthew 16 verse 8. And let's get ready for the communion because we're going to break bread and pray about two or three things um, as we break bread. Matthew 16, 8. If I, let's start reading from verse 5. Now, when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourself because you have brought no bread? The word little here is inserted by the translators of the English Bible. The original text says, O oh, ye of no faith. Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 32, 20. So that you can see it more exactly. Let's go to another verse of scripture. Mark chapter 4, verse 40. I want you to see where God is at this time. So that if we are going to walk with him, we're not just walking aimlessly. Mark chapter 4, verse 40. What does it say? But he said to them, this is the account of when Jesus told his disciples, let us go to the other side. Verse 35. Let's read from verse 35 because 
I, I think sometimes I assume every one of us is familiar with the stories of Jesus and his disciples. But look, let's read it here for, to fulfill all righteousness. Mark, Mark chapter 4 verse 35. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waters and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. That is, it was taken in water. Verse 38 says, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Another account in the gospel says, you wicked and perverse generation. How much longer do I have to put up with you? Why have you no faith? And you're wondering, okay, these people were truly dying. The Bible says the boat was already filling with water. A God who cares, will he truly be sleeping when your boat is taken in water? Now that's the way most of us think. The disciples were no different. They were thinking to themselves, wait a minute. The situation that we're in, Antoine, you've been in situations that were so critical that you wonder if God is on vacation. You're like, wait a minute. Does the Bible not say that God sees everything and he knows everything? Is he pretending, is that same God pretending like he can't see that we're about to be evicted? Is he pretending that he can't see that my account is overdrawn? Is he pretending that he can't see that these people are talking bad about me? And you're wondering because your situation, what you're looking at, what you're assessing is so critical. And you want God to act based on the criticality of your assessment. Sorry to bust your bubble, but God is not afraid of the things that scare you. And God is not where you're at most of the time. The situation that you're in, sometimes you're there because God wants you to see beyond that situation. Now let me explain this to you because sometimes we think that we're more righteous than Peter, James, and John. You know, you read their stories and you're like, oh my God, these people are walking with Jesus, the living, breathing Jesus. And they were still asking these kinds of questions. But when you think about your own situation, be honest, you have yelled at God multiple times because you're like, God, do you not see what I'm going through? They said, do you not care that we perish? So because they were human beings and they responded to a situation that was critical, Jesus said they had no faith. How is that even fair? Let's not be religious for a moment. Let's be very practical. How, why would you castigate me for using the senses that you gave me? You gave me a sense of survival is called the animal instinct. That when I'm in a boat and the boat is filling with water, I should call out for help. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. You see what I mean? Someone insulted my wife and you're saying that I shouldn't go and slap their face. No, that is, that is what I'm supposed to do. Protect the wife that you have given to me. You understand what I mean? But the Lord is trying to teach his disciples a lesson that all of us have to make sure that we learn. Jesus said to them, O oh, you of little faith, which now that we know he was quoting Deuteronomy 32, 20, O oh, you of no faith. Now, what is the problem? Why am I a wicked person? Why did Jesus group all of them and call them that and say to them that they belong to a wicked and perverse generation simply because we cried for help? Jesus, are you being too stern here? Are you being too mean? Just be nice a little, Jesus. And Jesus is letting us know that everybody that ignores the word of God and pays all the attention in their heart to situation and to things are wicked. Because God is saying, look, if you look at things and situations 
and you allow them to be bigger than I am in your life, then you have not allowed my righteousness to have a place in you. When there's no righteousness, what do you have? Wickedness. What is the word of God? The word of God is the truth. When you are not in the truth, you are in perversion. And God is right. Jesus was right in calling them a wicked and a perverse generation simply because of the fact that everything that came out of their mouth was as a result of their needs, a result of their situation, not in response to the word of God. Now let me expose to you God's expectation. God's expectation is always made very clear. You see, God is not a wicked judge. God is not going to ask you to do something that he hasn't made very clear. So what did God say to them that they did not live up to? He said to them in Matthew, in Mark chapter 4 verse 35, he says, let us cross over to the other side. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what your situation is. You need to go back and remember what God said about that situation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you don't pay attention to the word of God and if you don't follow with all your heart what the word of God says, then you have no faith. And without faith, you cannot speak to mountains. Without faith, you cannot speak to the sea. Many of us, even when we're praying that God should deliver us from the situation that we're in, we're yelling at God, we're complaining about men, we're describing the situation, and there's no scripture that talks about describing situations. Jesus says you will speak to this mountain and it will respond. Jesus himself, when they finally woke him up, what did he do? He didn't complain that they were bad sailors. He didn't complain that they disturbed his sleep. He just spoke, the Bible says Jesus spoke to the sea and told the sea to behave itself. I'm going to say two things very quickly. Because when the Holy Spirit revealed this series of things to me, He told me specifically, He said, many people don't even know that these things are issues. They're not even paying attention to the fact that they don't have a word from God for the situation that they're in. So they don't even know what to believe. That is the reason why everything appears real. Let me tell you something. Some of the things that appear real to you, that appear pressing, that appear like they're going to take your life away, will disappear the moment you shine the light of the word of God. Apply what I just said right now to what the disciples were going through. Tia, Jesus said to them, let us go to the other side. If you truly believe that whatever God says, he fulfills it. And he already says, let us go to the other side. Between this side and the other side, if the storms come, I'm not going to be afraid because Jesus already told me that we're going to the other side. The reason why they were afraid is because they didn't believe what Jesus said. They believed more what they were seeing. But if you believe what God has said, if God tells me that we're going to the other side, the Bible says faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. If God already said to you that as for you and your household, you will serve the Lord, then why should you be sad, depressed, and frustrated when your child is misbehaving? You should not let that bad behavior be bigger than the word that God has given to you. All you have to do is speak to the situation and the will of God will be done. I'm telling you folks, I'm not in a hurry anymore. I was in a hurry to get to the prayer because there's a prayer burning in my heart. But I'm not in a hurry anymore. I want to make sure that you all get this. 
Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is what you should live your life by. God has given to you everything. God has given you righteousness, peace, and joy. So the reason why you don't have joy sometimes is because you walk away from him and you're asking him to come to where you're at. And God is like, no, I'm not going to leave my word to come to your sentiment. You need to come here. It doesn't matter whether you've been praying for seven days and fasting for seven nights. You cannot get God to abandon his will. Jesus was doing the will of the father. His mother was crying and calling for him and Jesus refused because the will of God is where we all need to be positioned. You may be saying, but I've been praying, I've been fasting, I've been quoting scriptures. And God is like, okay, yeah. But are you believing what you're saying? Are you doing my will? For you to enjoy the kingdom of God and all of what it promises, you need to believe what God said, even if it doesn't look like what you're seeing. The disciples, to them, it looked like they were going to die that day. But what did 435 say? 435 said, Jesus said to them, that same day, let us go to the other side. The moment Jesus tells you you're going to the other side, you will not die that day. That situation will not overshadow you. I know what I am saying it might sound like I'm making it so simple how to live this life. But Jesus came so that you can live life with ease. He says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. It is not the economy and your ability to work it. It is what he says. If he says to you, praise the Lord. If the Lord Jesus has already said to you that I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Whenever you see lack in your life, you're not supposed to speak to God and be saying, God, do you not care that I perish? Do you not see my lack? Are you no longer the provider? Speak to the situation and just say, lack be gone. Some of us need to speak to our bank accounts to become fat. Some of us need to speak to our jobs to become possible. They give you things that work to do and you keep struggling. No, just speak to it because the word of God already says that your burden is light and your yoke is easy because Jesus has given you his. You know one of the things that I've seen lately that just breaks my heart? I give it as an example just now how people are struggling to raise godly children today. Whereas the word of God says, that the things of God, they belong to you and to your children. And so if you already know the things of God, many of us know that the word of God says to not forsake the gathering together of ourselves. But whenever you tell your children it's time to go to church, they get angry. They make excuses. That's when they remember that they have a homework that if they don't do it, Jesus would have to die again. And you're like, well, isn't this so simple? that we know we need to do what the word of God says. Why do I have to, why does it have to be so difficult? It is difficult because you are looking at the magnitude of the situation. You are assessing their stubbornness and disobedience and you're allowing that to overwhelm you whereas all you're supposed to do is speak to their heart to know the truth. The Bible says you and your children will know the truth. Let me say that to you again. The Bible says that the hidden mysteries of secret places that belong to you and to your children. So if you have already known the right thing to do, then your child also by God needs to know the right thing to do. Don't be fighting, don't be yelling, don't be cursing. Just speak the word of God and continue to speak that word until you get to the other side. Rather than being in their pants, because the Bible says the boat was filling with water. I believe it's not just water coming from the sea. Some of the water was coming from them. They were sweating and they were peeing. Rather than doing all of that, that was the most difficult thing to do. It was easier for them to just stand in there and say the storms may blow. The waters may come in, but the word of the Lord says we are going to the other side. And guess what? If they had spoken so, there would not have been any reason to go and bother God. You and I will bother God all the time to do things for us that he has already done. He has already given you his word. The Bible says he gave them his word and his word heals them freely. Most of what you're looking for has already been released in a verse of scripture or two. Just find what God says. Hold on to it and let it take you to the other side. I want to encourage you folks. This message 
is like three messages in one and I'm going to tell you the three things that I have said because and I'll tell you why I have said them thing number one is this we have come to such a time wherein people who are not prepared will try to distract you will try to take your joy one of the ways by which they're going to do it is this they will tell you of all the things that they need to do so that you can feel like you're not doing enough they they will tell you how they're responding to all the trouble in the world so that you can feel like just trusting God is not enough they would come and they would try to take away your oil so that you can stop resting on the Word of God when people like that come just tell them to keep on keeping busy that you are good just where you're at the five wise virgins said to the foolish virgins you may need to go and buy oil since you are complaining you have none but for us we are just fine tell them trusting God is enough for you let me say this some of us here we have spouses that are unbelieving spouses and when they look at the way that you're about to live your life in the face of the storm that is coming to the world they may want to agitate you you have to declare by God and just say you know what God says that we will not lack anything good and I believe him don't try to argue don't try to debate just speak the word of God the moment the five wise virgins spoke what happened the foolish ones left them alone let the word of God fight for you let the word of God ease your pain let the word of God bring peace to your home if you try to debate people based on situations they know the situation better than you for crying out loud they are fishermen they're always on the water they can describe to you all the dangers of a storm like that but I am not a fisherman. I'm not arguing with you. But I know what the word of God says. Jesus did not come and say, Oh, this little storm. This storm is not enough to sink this boat. They would have tried to convince Jesus and say, Sir, you're a carpenter. We know these waters. No, but Jesus knew the sea. Because he knew the word. He was the word. So I'm encouraging you. When the five foolish virgins come to try to distract you from simply trusting in God, don't let them give you all the reasons in the book for you to be agitated, for you to be afraid. People have said things to me like this in the past, that man, you're living your life too simple, too easily. And I'm like, uh, that was the will of God for me. Yeah, he says, come unto me, those of you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am living in his rest because he's done everything for me. My focus is just to create capacity to download per time what I need. Thing number two that I said to us is this. You see, many people are seen by heaven as wicked and perverse. Why? Because they have no faith. And why do they not have faith? Because they don't have the word of God. You see, when you have the word of God and you follow the word of God and you abide by what it says by doing it, guess what? Your strength will be renewed. You will mount up with wings because God's word is not just to be read or heard. It's supposed to be done. Just do what it says. If it says, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. If the word of God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. The moment you do it, you will find strength to do the next one which comes. And the third thing which I said is this, as we have come to this particular point in time, God is looking for those who will have the heart of resilience to stand by the word of God, regardless of what they see. The reason why I've told you those three things is because of the fact that Satan's run out of time and we all know it. And one of the things that we're seeing in the world today is that the battle that was in the heavens has come to the earth. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I told the leaders on the call on Tuesday, on Thursday, that one of the things that I've noticed is that right now in the newspaper, on social media, in the news, there is a lot of exposure going on. People are confessing about wars that have been fought that needed not be fought. People are talking about child molestation. They're talking about all kinds of rituals. I mean, all, all, all kinds of horrible things that have happened in the corridors of power, in corporations and in governments. And you're like, wait a minute. Are these people just going to allow everybody to be exposing these secrets? No, they're not allowing it. They are the ones behind the exposure. 
They are the ones funding the musicians and the rappers and the actors that are revealing the secrets because they need to get the word out as a sign of the times that we are in. The Bible says there is nothing hidden that shan't be revealed. The time has come for these things to be revealed. This is one of the very last signs before the Armageddon is over. And so I say this to you. Ah, uh, y'all have heard me say things about lesser magic, wherein evil people would have to tell you what they're about to do, so that when they do it, they would have power over you because they already told you. So now it's on you. Did you prepare for what we said? They say it jokingly. That is lesser magic, okay? But now, what we're seeing right now is beyond lesser magic. They're not telling you what they're about to do. They're owning up to what they have already done. And the reason why they are saying that is because to tell you what they have already done is more powerful than them telling you. Do you know how that works? Can I just tell you, take 20 seconds to tell you how that works? You see, when wicked people are telling you what they have already done, what they are looking to do is to get you to take vengeance on your own. They want you to hear of the wickedness that they have done so that you can now get emotional about the situation and be lashing out from your flesh. Because when they can get you to move in the flesh, they can overpower you. Because the flesh is not what Jesus gave power to. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Wicked people are paying podcasters and paying everybody to tell you that they have been stealing your money, that they have been doing rituals, even using little kids, that they have been doing all these things simply because if you are not in the spirit, your initial reaction will be to say a bad word. Your initial reaction will be to go to anger and frustration. And the moment they can get you to be in the flesh, they recruit you to their side. Because the Bible says, to be carnally minded is enmity against God. So the moment you are in the flesh, Guess what? They have recruited you. And so when you hear those things, don't be angry, just smile. I just say, I know what you're doing, but the battle is the Lord's. I am not going to get angry. I'm not going to let anybody drive me by emotions because I am ready to wait for the salvation of God because Jesus says, I am coming and I will bring judgment upon the wicked. Jesus is coming with judgment upon the wicked. If I, if I cannot trust Jesus to judge wickedness, then why should I trust him to come reward righteousness? It is one of the most subtle things that Satan's ever done. But many believers are so asleep. I've, people will send me messages. They will send me links to videos of some ex-FBI person saying this and this ex-CIA person saying that. And they will be so angry in their voicemail. And I'll be like, ah, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. If I guess what? We're not even praying against them. We're not even responding to it. Because they're using it to bait us out. So what do we do? We continue to just sing praises to God. Because we are not worried about what they have done. We are excited about what we are about to receive. So when the five foolish virgins come, what do you do? Tell them to continue on their way. When your situation looks so terrifying, tell yourself, it's okay. Jesus says, we're making it to the other side. And he's already gone there. He's waiting for me. And how is Jesus doing it? If Jesus is on the pillow sleeping, then what am I doing? Watching the water come in. No, I'm just going to lay next to him. If he gets to sink in this water, then we sink together. Where he is, there I will be also. The kind of faith you need to have in God is the kind of faith that says that if God sinks, you're sinking with him. When Jesus was on the cross, one of the thieves that was crucified with him was like, oh, you can't really be the Messiah because look at you, you're on the cross. The other one was like, look, I believe you are the Messiah. Whatever becomes of you, let it become of me. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, we, we are trying to anticipate an outcome that we think is favorable. The only favorable outcome in this life to be is to be where God is. That is the only safe place, is to be where God is. And where is God? Is where his word is. 
Because the Bible says that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And who is Jesus? The Word of God that became flesh. Be where the Word of God is and it's going to be well with you. Now we're going to go ahead and pray. This is what we're going to pray about. As I was praying, as we were in worship, I saw a big stone, a massive, massive stone. It's almost like someone takes a mountain, uproots it, and puts it on the surface. It was a huge stone. And when I saw the stone, I was like, wait a minute, what is this? And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, the reprobate mind is a mind that has a spirit behind it. And the moment he said that, I knew exactly what he was telling me. When God made man, he made man from the clay, from the dust of the earth. And the Bible says the Lord breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. So every mind, every ideology, every thinking, every mindset has a spirit behind it. The reprobate mind or the debased mind is what we are seeing fully operational in the world today that is making people confused about their sexuality and not just that, encouraging them to continue to deceive others in doing the same. Because you know that now they have gotten to the point of helping babies in the hospital that are less than 12 months old choose their sexuality. You understand what I mean? now? Those things don't make sense. And that's what the debased mind does. So when I saw the stone, I immediately started to look for what the stone is sitting on. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're looking in the right place. He said the stone is blocking the duct that is carrying in the wind. What the devil has done is the devil has put such a weight on this generation to stop the flow of the Spirit of God. And when there is no Spirit of God, people feel so choked. The reason why young people are committing suicide, the reason why several people are getting depressed is because they are not getting a supply of the oxygen of heaven. And when people cannot breathe, they cannot live. The devil has brought a big stone the stone of unbelief, the stone of ignorance, the stone of rebellion to block the wind of the Holy Spirit from getting to the hearts of men. And why would God show me that? He's showing me that so that we all can pray for the stone to be removed and cast into the sea. We want to see revival. We want to see people breathe once again the life of God and come to their senses. Do you know that if you cut oxygen to the brain for a while, people become dis disillusioned? They become delusional. Dr. John can tell you that. He has a PhD in psychiatry. When you cut the oxygen, people can't think straight. People become weak. People become frustrated. People just don't find any reason to live. But the moment the wind begins to flow, people are revived. What is the meaning of revival? Revive. Vive is life. To have life again. To be able to breathe again. So if we want to see revival, we need that stone removed. Now this stone in particular that I saw is one that is cutting the supply of the life of God from children. I don't know when this praying for children thing is going to end, but while it is still on, Let's do it every single day. So as we break bread today, we're going to break bread with a verse of scripture from Micah that addresses this prayer or that we can use to buttress this prayer. So come with me to Micah chapter 2 verse 3. The book of Micah is just before the book of Nahum and we're going to read chapter 2 verse 3. Okay, it's right after the book of Jonah, if that's the first one you see. Chapter 2, verse 3, what does it say? It says, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil time. 
The Bible says, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk heartily, for this is an evil time. God is on the move. He already said in his word that those who dig a pit will fall into it. So the ones that Satan has used to put the stone on the necks of this generation that we are praying for, that is cutting the air supply, that is not allowing them to breathe. When you listen to what their spirits are saying, their spirits are saying that they cannot breathe because of this stone that is not allowing them to take in the life of God. And without the life of God, you do not have the mind of Christ. So when the Holy Spirit is revealing this and asking us to pray, the confidence that we have is that this is exactly what God is doing too. The Bible says when we pray in accordance to his will, it's over. And God is saying, I will put this same stone on their neck. And so God wants that stone to be removed from where it is, from the neck of our children. To be on the neck of the family that call themselves the elite of the world. So that their own life is cut out. It's important for us to do our part. Jesus says, you shall say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Once it gets into the sea, leave the rest to God. He will take it and it will sink the enemies of our progress. I want to tell you something that is very significant. The reason why God is looking to you and I to partner with him is because it is more fun from God's perspective when his children are involved in this conquest. God could have done it alone, but he says, I want you to provide the stone. He could have fallen Goliath alone, but he needed David to gather the stones. It was not David's stone that delivered the stone, I mean, David's sling that delivered the stone to the head of Goliath. Such precision is only by God, but David had to get the stones. We need to pray for the stone to be removed. And then we will watch God take that stone and put it on the neck of this family and they will not come out of it ever. What is the confidence that we have that the millennia will truly happen because the wicked will not rise again? So let us read that verse of scripture again. God says, I will bring disaster against that family and they will not be able to remove their neck. They will no longer be able to walk heartily. All the evil times that they have created is coming on them. Satan has used people and used system to keep our children away from God, to keep an entire generation in darkness. But guess what? They will breathe again. It's gonna be the life of God. Many people's children will wake up and say, you know what, mom? It's Saturday, right? We're going to church. And you'll be like, uh, did that just come from you? No, it just came from the Lord. You see, many people will go and submit themselves to a rehabilitation because of where they have been and you would not have to twist their arm simply because they didn't do all of those things because they were evil boys and girls. They did all those things because the air supply of the life of God was cut. And once the air comes in again, they will start to think right. They will start to behave right. We are not fighting shadows. We are speaking the word of God. And change is happening. And so as we break bread today, we're going to just make that a verse of scripture. And just thank God because God is doing this battle. And he's going to hand over the victory to us yet again. And so let's just give God thanks because these children will breathe again. Let's give God thanks that this generation will know Jesus again. Let's give God thanks because we know that when the life of God flows, guess what? It brings healing everywhere that it goes. We have been praying. We have been believing God. And now God has revealed to us his divine strategy. Let that stone be removed and cast into the sea. In the mighty name of Jesus, the stone that Satan has placed upon the neck of this next generation that has caused a seizure, that has caused them to not have the fullness of the life of God.
we declare that that stone be removed in the mighty name of Jesus. Our children will receive the life of Christ. Our children will have the mind of Christ. Our children will love God with all their hearts. Our children will not be swayed anymore by the cares of this world and by the deception therein. But they will awake unto righteousness and sin no more. Because the evil that was plotted by Satan will fall upon the heads of those that he has been using. And those that Jesus has received will come to the foot of the cross. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. I have a piece of good news before we break bread from Galatians chapter 5. And I just want you to take this and make a note of it. Some of us need to read it again and again to help restore the joy that we have lost. One of the things that the Lord showed to me about 24 hours ago is that there are so many people. I'm not going to name any names. There's no need to. But there are people that I've seen even in our meetings as recent as two weeks ago that I saw in this vision and they were walking around and they look very sad. Let me tell you something. God has joy for you that is a personal joy. Not just joy that happens when you come into fellowship with other believers. Yes, when we come into the presence of our Heavenly Father, the Bible says there is fullness of joy. But God wants you to have joy on your own. You have been struggling to be joyful. Fear not, I have prayed for you. But the Lord wants you to receive that fullness of joy. I saw several people and it's like every day they want to be happy but they just can't shake off the heaviness. I pray for you today once again that you will believe the word of God. The reason why you're sad, the reason why the enemy takes your peace and your joy is because you have moments wherein you believe yourself more than you believe Jesus. You believe in what you have done and what you can do more than what he has done and more than what he can do. So I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, every unbelief and every misappropriation of the name of God cease in your life. That you will have confidence in God in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. That you will believe that your God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That He doesn't love you any less today because of what you have failed to do. He loves you as much today as He did the day that He died for you. He loves you as much today as He will when He receives you into glory. Believe in the Lord and you shall be saved from all this violence. You will be saved from the turbulence of, of pain, of, of, of grief, of sadness you will be saved from them all just believe in the Lord and begin to walk in joy lift up your head you daughter of Zion because the Lord is for you and not against you I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus there will be no delay in you in your receiving of this joy that is long overdue he sees you let me tell you something God sees you in the last two weeks or so I have done not much of praying for anything else but just for people. The moment I start praying in tongues, I start seeing the faces of people. And so I tell you what, God cares enough to put you on someone else's heart because he doesn't want you to continue to be sorrowful. Lift up your head. He is for you and not against you. Galatians chapter 5 verse 2. And then we're going to break bread and be out of here. Alrighty, look at what it says. It says, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. The good news here is that God is saying, if you think doing things differently is what's going to bring you joy, then you have chosen to come under a new system. And that system will require that you do things right all the time for you to be at peace. But you have tried doing things right all the time and failed. Why don't you choose the system of grace? Which means that I should be at peace whether I have done what is expected of me or not. I should be at peace whether I have done right by my own commitments or not. I should have joy because it is not by circumcision. It is by grace. So that I no longer feel like there is a debt that I must 
pay. Jesus paid it all. You see, for you to be effective in walking with God, you need strength, and that strength comes from His joy, and that joy comes from knowing that it doesn't matter what happens, you are loved. Every day, you are loved. So stop trying to check all the boxes. Stop trying to do everything right. Be at peace and everything will be right. I say this specifically to a handful of people that I have seen that the Lord's revealed to me. One of the reasons why your joy is being taken is because you keep telling yourself you can do better. And you hold yourself to such a standard and guilt is eating you from the inside out. You cannot do better without God's help. So why don't you just focus on always believing that His help is available to you always. Let us lay hold of the bread and the wine and make that declaration of faith that as we partake of the body of Jesus today and drink of His blood, we do so in remembrance of Him so that every part of our being will be reminded that Jesus already paid the price that he is our joy, that he is our peace. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. The last thing we're gonna do before Alan comes to receive the offerings and, and give us some announcements is this. I, I see this and I just want us to address it real quick. Matthew chapter 17, 7 verse 18, sorry. And I want us to just address this very quickly. Matthew 7, 18 says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Many of us, we're not willing to let go of some of the things that we have been familiar with, that we are, that we are familiar with. And that is, not, that is the reason why we're not bearing, bearing good fruits. Let me give you an example of one of those things. Many of us, we are familiar with the practice of feeling good before we do good. We're so obsessed with feeling good before we do good. That is an old tree that needs to be uprooted so that you can start bearing good fruits. Antoine, I don't have to feel good about myself before I pray. I don't have to feel good about myself before I have a good expectation that God will do something awesome. The devil knows how to manipulate our feelings. And that is the reason why we need to abandon the feelings game and stick to the faith game. The confidence game. The good God game. Just know that your God is good. You will pray more the moment you overcome your feelings. And how do you overcome your feelings? Do not regard them as anything. You know what David said? David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Because God does not regard iniquity. He doesn't impute sin against you. So anything that you regard will continue to hold weight in your life. There is a good tree that God has planted and that is your spirit that is born again. You can always pray and God will hear you. You can always sing in the spirit and all the heaviness will fall. You can always study the word of God. It doesn't matter what you have just done. You may have just yelled at somebody. You may have just done something silly by your own standards, but that doesn't mean you should lose another moment waiting until you feel good before you do good. Do good by grace and you will feel good by God. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray for one more category of people and then I'm going to get off this stage. I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus. As many of you as are standing here today, and you keep saying, if God can just take care of this one thing, I think I'll be able to apply these teachings, these truths. But this one thing, I don't know what else to do. I can't just abandon it. It looks like it's so urgent. I, I can't just abandon it. If I don't pay these bills, if I don't do this, I just can't abandon it. 
I'm trying to pray, but my mind is there all the time. If there is that one thing that has been nagging you to the ground, that one thing that is pressing, I want you to raise your hand wherever you're at. I have sought the Lord concerning this situation and the word of the Lord is this to you. Speak to that situation and there will be peace. There is a divine grace, a divine enablement that is available today to take care of that financial situation, to take care of that feeling that you have in your body. You've been sick for a very long time and you're like, God, if you can just let this sickness be over, then I'm going to get started. A clean slate, doing all of the things that your servant's been prophesying. I just need the symptoms gone. The Lord is releasing you from those things this moment. And the Lord is releasing over you the breakthrough that you need. It is this one-time delivery. And what I mean by one-time delivery is the Lord is doing it this very moment and you will not have to worry about it again. This is called the mercy of God in action. I want you to call forth that situation to mind right now. Speak to that situation no matter what it is. Infirmity, finances, a difficult spouse, some difficult children, that same thing that has been a burden. In fact, there is somebody here for three months, three months, there's been no peace in your home. Even when it looks like it, you are sure that it's about to disappear again because someone's about to say something and everybody's about to be upset. The Lord is saying, lasting peace comes now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lasting peace comes now. You have been behind you, the same you, you have been behind for months. When it comes to your finances, the Lord says, by His divine intervention, a new slate is being given to you to begin to do the will of your heavenly Father. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for your faithfulness, for your redemptive power, for your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Natalie, I want you to call your son as soon as you can and tell him to not worry, but pray. Okay? You need to tell him that quickly because he's losing time worrying. So just tell him, whatever that thing is that you think you can fix by just thinking about it. He thinks he's thinking about it, but he's really worrying about it. Tell him to just pray, to just sit down with God and say, God, this is it. How do we go about this? What have you for me? And his face will light up again. Just pick up the phone and call him. I know that I said one last thing, but I know that there is grace for healing in the house tonight and I want to pray for anybody who needs physical healing in their body. Physical healing, very quickly, come forth. I'm just going to lay my hands on you and pray for you. What is it? You just feel you've been aching all over. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, that which I have received is that which I gave in the name of Jesus let the life of God the wind of heaven saturate your entire being and bring you peace and now pain and discomfort be gone in the mighty name of Jesus body receive vitality receive peace in the name of Jesus don't worry you will feel strong in your body in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? What is it, ma'am? I've been experiencing on the right side of my body. Okay. Same thing as her. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let this arm receive strength. Let this entire body receive vitality. In the mighty name of Jesus. Peace. I speak the peace of God to your entire being. Receive peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Every thought that needs to be renewed, addressed, for this peace to be lasting, let it be done even now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Peace be unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What is it? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Infirmity, be gone. In the mighty name of Jesus. Never to return. And every symptom that the brain has come to register, that the body has come 
to be familiar with. Let them become alien and extracted also so that you will not reload that which the Lord has delivered you from. Let your body receive healing in the mighty name of Jesus. This moment, you are free. For whom the Son says free, is free indeed. You are made whole in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. I saw you. That infirmity, I declare it cursed the day in the mighty name of Jesus. And I declare that your heart and soul will receive the mercy of God that has come for you today as a divine intervention to set you free and to set you. I see you standing upon your high places, Tia. Wherein all those things that have so easily beset you now fall below you. So that you can have joy in doing the will of your Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Woman, you are free to go. Free to go. Healed of infirmity in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this man. God. Already. So what is it? So that's because you stand alone. But the Bible says that by his stripes we have been healed. And as the Lord heals you, may you receive the divine enablement to do what you need to do on the daily basis without your body reminding you that it is flesh. Let strength come upon you. A strength that never fails. In the mighty name of Jesus. So I pray for every symptom that you have been experiencing to be neutralized. And then I pray that this affliction gone will not return. For the word of God says affliction will not arise. For this very moment, let the balm of Gilead soothe your knee. Be healed right this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know that the power of God is upon you. Receive the fullness of your healing. The mercy of God overrides every unbelief. The mercy of God overrides every infirmity. Overrides every weakness. Be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Is it just this one knee? The Lord has spoken over you today that he has healing for you and that healing is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All righty. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, 
this very moment your body will draw life from the presence of God the life that it needs to be restored unto wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus I pray for every issue that you have had in your digestive system to cease this very moment as you go from this place none of those symptoms goes with you as you go from this place none of that will return to you you are going home to sleep safely and soundly to eat and to have your body accept the food as it should in the mighty name of Jesus it is well with you leave in Jesus name lose that congestion in the mighty name of Jesus let it be gone this very moment you will breathe and you will take in the life of God because the stone is lifted in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord hallelujah yes are you standing in for somebody else who is that oh yeah okay father in Jesus name as soon as you walked here I heard that you were standing in for somebody so everyone that you're standing in for today particularly David I want you to send them a message even if you live in the same house with them and let them know that God has touched them and they are healed send it to them so that whenever doubt comes they can look at that message and be reminded of the Word of God but as for you in the mighty name of Jesus that which is in your heart is done this very moment in Jesus name praise the Lord praise God hallelujah is that everybody anoint him with oil anoint him with oil you see the thing is you have prayed for him and the Bible says that the prayer of faith will heal the sick anoint him with oil to release the fullness of that which you have declared young man from this moment onwards this flesh is alien to infirmities from here onwards your skin will be radiant even more radiant than that of Naaman after he came out of the Jordan after that seven deep that he came out that his flesh was renewed so shall yours be all the days of your life the enemy miscalculated by attacking you this early because now you will enjoy it the rest of your life this wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord praise God if you have somebody else that you know that needs healing why don't you just call their name where you're at put your hand on your chest as a point of contact to them and declare their wholeness and their healing in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare my mom's wholeness and healing. Every infirmity of the heart that has troubled her, plagued her up until now, I declare it gone once and for all in the mighty name of Jesus. You do the same for your loved ones and testimonies will abound to the name of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Alan. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's give God praise. Let's give him praise. Father, we thank you so much for meeting with us tonight, oh God. Hallelujah. You'll see we have um, offering envelopes to the side there. Let's give just uh, as a sign of our faith, our thanks unto the Lord. We'll just wait a couple of seconds for us to prepare our offering. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we love you. We thank you, O oh God, for what you have done tonight, how you have extended your mercy towards us, O oh God, your love and kindness. Lord, we ask of thee as we give as a sign of our praise, of our worship and thanks unto you, O oh God. Let these offerings be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. Lord, we ask that your mercy prevail in our life, oh God. We thank you for every word that you have spoken by your Holy Spirit through your servant, the prophet, oh God. Holy Spirit, help us to run with it. We thank you how you dealt with our faith on tonight, oh God, and how you have dealt with our unbelief, oh God, how you have just shown how merciful you are as we have come to be before your feet, oh God. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, and so be it. Hallelujah. 
Y'all know we'll be back here Tuesday, 6.30 for Family Dinner and Teaching Tuesday. I'm so thankful again for what the Lord is doing. Please don't miss a meeting. This is the final hour. Don't miss a meeting. Be a part of this fellowship. Be a part of this oil, this wine that is flowing by the Holy Ghost. And we give God glory. Everyone be safe and have a blessed night. <laughs>